my clients tell me that I'm an expert on CMO success and strategic marketing. I have actually have the largest community of dynamic CMOs in the Washington, D.C. area. And my favorite things to do are working with them to create healthier, more sustainable companies. They and their customers benefit greatly, and they ultimately become more profitable. Um, so that's what I do. And uh, in my free time, I love writing and speaking to groups and organizations who are really looking at the world now through a different lens and know that uh, the old models of industrial age thinking and, and uh, working until you drop are no longer sustainable approaches. So uh, being a health nut myself, I'm just bringing my healthy principles and mindful approaches to organizations, and, and I love every moment of it. I was just approaching my 40th birthday, and I had uh, been working for this company for a very short time because they had purchased our consulting organization, which was called On Target. And I, here I had been transported from this entrepreneurial professional services firm into this billion dollar plus bureaucracy. And with time, my soul started to kind of leave my body and I was just kind of this mechanistic robot that went to work, made tons of money and started spending my time worrying about stock price and revenue targets. And I realized at that moment that I was really unhappy and very unfulfilled. And worst of all, I was a terrible employee. So I, the tough choice I made is I said, I've got to fire myself because I am not serving this organization. And that's what put me on this 14-year uh, trajectory of running my own business and doing what I really, really love. I really have a few. And... I, even, I don't even like the word toughest because I just think they're daily challenges that help me find that extra 1% improvement in my life. And my men, one of my mentors, Alan Weiss, believes in the 1% solutions. He says, you know, if, if you improve by 1% every day, in, in two, he says in two months, you're twice as good. So I'm, I'm not sure that they're tough challenges. I just think that they're they're daily reminders of how to push myself to the next level. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm an athlete in my free time and I just, um, you know, I'm an open water competitive swimmer. And so always looking for that 1% is really important to me. For me, there are three. One is um, making time to reflect through meditation. Mm -hmm. That's number one, so that I can be a good leader to my community and to my friends and my husband. And second is making sure I make time to be healthy. And, you know, as far as I know, I've only been given one body and one brain in this lifetime. So um, with that in mind, I've got to take care of it. And so what kind of food, you know, how am I, what's my diet? How often am I exercising and how much sleep am I getting? Yeah. Those are the questions that I am uh, constantly asking myself. And then the other set of tough questions that I ask myself are around um, how am I really pushing the envelope with my clients? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have to remind myself that if I want to just be friends with my clients or I want to just be friends with others, I can you know, adopt more cats because cats give you unconditional love. But my real purpose is not to be their friend. It's to really be their, um, their instigator and to poke and provoke them. Mm -hmm. And that means that sometimes they're not going to like me and that's okay. It, you know, it's, the goal is to help them move to another level of performance. Well, my primary clients tend to be CEOs and CMOs, chief marketing officers, and the role of marketing leaders, whether you are a, are a manager of public relations or you're a chief marketing officer, their roles are so dramatically different than they were three years ago. And as a result of that, they're easily persuaded or drawn into shiny objects. Mm -hmm whether that's how to make a better Facebook page or you know, how to improve your search rankings or other, 
other things that I consider rather mindless. So the first thing that I share with my clients and that's rather contrarian is I say, instead of learning how to do more, I'm going to challenge you to see how you can be more. Hmm. And that that's a big shift for them is, you mean, I, I shouldn't be doing more, hiring more people, embracing more social platforms, becoming more of a digital diva? And the answer is no. No, it's really about who you're going to be as a leader. Hmm. And um, a lot of the research from MIT on, on the deleterious impact of multitasking and spending too much time with our devices is so over oh, it's so persuasive around this that it I don't think any of us can ignore it mm-hmm. and um, so really how can we be more how can we create more white space on our calendars so we can really be that reflective leader so that, I think that's the first first one mm-hmm. and the second is how can I be a better critical thinker? And that, that's a big one because we re- you and I only have three choices about how we use our time. There are three buckets. One is dealing with yesterday's chronic issues and trying to get rid of them. Number two is dealing with the pop-up issues of du jour. Those kinds of pop-up issues that, that just rule our everyday lives. And then the third is inventing the future. And making time to really ask those questions of what's next. And as I look across my universe of clients and readers, the majority of the leaders are only, they're focused 100% of their time between the first two boxes. Mm -hmm. Chronic issues of yesterday and inbox crisis management. Mm -hmm. And how can you possibly be a leader if you make no time to think of the future? Mm -hmm. If I can help my clients just carve out even 10% or 15% of their lives so they're asking the what instead of the how, that's a good thing. I can't be a critical thinker if I'm constantly in this firefighting mode. I mean, I have a client who I worked with for a couple of years and his mantra was, you know, if he didn't have a crisis, he felt like he wasn't useful. Mm -hmm. And based on his health issues, his family issues... And his inability to meet commitments at work, it was obvious to me that it was beginning, you know, he was doing things that were not really his his true north. And he was really thinking that his only, he was really kind of high on the drug of crisis management. And, um, and that made him perhaps a very good manager, but a very ineffective leader. You know, this is a real career limiter for him as a CMO. I mean, humans, we are funny creatures because about 90% of the time, we really don't make a change until there's some crisis. Like, oh my God, I just got back from the doctor. My cholesterol is off the charts. I need to go get some Lipitor and maybe I should stop eating so much, uh, so much cheese and butter, you know. Um, that's unfortunately how most of us operate for whatever it's worth, right or wrong. Um, but, you know, there are that percentage of people that say, I'm doing okay. You know, I've got my basic needs met. I have a roof over my head. I can afford to fill the refrigerator. And I have some loving friends and relationships. And, uh, you know, my body works pretty well. So how can I make it better? And I'm not going to wait until that crisis. I'm thinking of the future. How can I be an even better wife as my husband and I celebrate our 25th anniversary this year, how can I be an even better wife, even though we've got a pretty darn good marriage? You know, so we're not, we're not in a divorce court right now. So let let me make sure that we can amp it up and make it even more fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And, and imagine if leaders thought about life that way. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, it's usually, we just have to ask ourselves how we live our lives and, Mm -hmm. You know, do we wait until the crisis or do we ask the challenging questions when things are going well and before complacency sets in? Uh, one is, there is, you know, we don't have a business life and a personal life. We have a life. And again, as far as I know, we only have one. 
So how do we make the most of it and bring our very best selves to work? Mm-hmm. And allowing people that, that diver, you know, diverse worldview, bringing that diverse worldview to work and enjoying diverse opinions is really important and to creating the workplace of tomorrow. And really good critical thinkers and leaders keep themselves open to the possibility that their worldview might not be serving them well and they're open to outside ideas and they're very open to other people challenging those ideas. That one's a tough one for CEOs because unfortunately they're often treated like rock stars and you know people filter and sanitize what they're going to tell the CEO before they go to the meeting and it's not serving anyone. Mm-hmm. So that's my first lesson and the second is that the future of work is about actionable actionable data not big data. And you know I have some contrarian views on big data. The data scientists don't always love me. Uh, but I don't think it's about more data. I don't think it's about having 75 key performance indicators on your dashboard. What I really believe is that it's finding those core elements that you can take action on so that you serve your customers better, so that you create new innovations that people get excited about, and that you're making the world better. And how I bring that to life is I say, we have, none of us are islands. We have to find communities. And I call the future the community economy. Hmm. We have to find communities and often create communities where we can foster that innovation and that future thinking and really uh, learn and collaborate with each other. Hmm. Sometimes tools like Skype and Google Hangouts can make that really, really easy, as can new software platforms that are being released almost daily, uh, such as Get Satisfaction, Lithium, and other platforms that are inexpensive and can almost instantly create brainstorming opportunities for improving or innovating. Wow. 